I'm going to pray in a second, but uh, we're going to be, Derek's going to be sharing um, uh, the message that with me this morning, and we've got a, a kind of a bit of a special one to bring um, today um, on a, our next instalment on this series of, of Becoming, how to uh, walk with Jesus, uh, walk, um, sorry, walk with Jesus, walk like Jesus, and today we're going to be thinking especially about corporate prayer, but also how that interfaces with mission and evangelism, which is so at the heart of who we are and what we want to do. So why don't, why don't I pray? Father, um, as we come to you this morning, um, we, we pray, Lord, we, we're aware of our own weakness, especially in this area of prayer and mission. And so, Father, we, we pray, Lord, would you now stir our hearts for you again. Turn our, our eyes and our ears towards you. And by your Holy Spirit, Lord, this morning, speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And, and just to say, even before we begin, you know, uh, I know I've kind of said this before, it's so often when I, whenever I, I feel like when I bring a message um, and, and preach at the front, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm so talking to myself at the same time as I'm, as I'm talking to anybody else. And, and I think especially messages like this, when we get to something like prayer, it can be one of those things that just makes us instantly feel so bad, can't it? We're like, oh, well, I feel awful. And today we're speaking about corporate prayer. And you think the thought of going to a prayer meeting with some other people at church, like, oh, no. You know, there's the list, isn't there? And, the, you know, watching the clock. And goodness, has it only been 10 minutes? You know, and, you know and, and, and we can feel quite bad about that sometimes, I know. But this morning, what I want you to hear is not, oh, come on, Hope Church, you bunch of losers, put, you pull it together. But nor there's just this you know, sense from the Lord of this invitation of, of, do you know what? There is so much more to be had in this area. And, you know, will we shoulder by shoulder, arm in arm, as we've already prayed this morning, you know, egg each other on to step into it and to hear that invitation and to move deeper with him and so please hear hear that heart this morning this is not about you know come on guys let's let's kind of crack on but but but, you know hear this invitation um to go to go deeper and i think this kind of starts perhaps with one of our core values as a church which is is transformation you know we've got these kind of three key values um, connect serve transform and we are passionate about seeing the transformation in people's lives we want them to experience that life-giving moment when they encounter jesus and sometimes in an instant Sometimes over a lifetime, normally, uh, uh, you know, s- several instances over a lifetime, sometimes the way it works, people do experience that, don't they? That transformation that comes as they experience Jesus. And, and obviously, I mean, we've just been talking, haven't we, about some of the hard things that are happening in, in the lives of, of people at church. And it's not become a Christian and all of your problems go away and life becomes easy. Stuff still happens and life is really hard. But it's just that in the midst of it all, there's this, there's this spark that won't go out. There's this hope that endures. There's this sense inside of you that goes, do you know what? I have a reason for living and a hope that cannot be extinguished. And I know that come what may, I will just keep on going because God is good and I trust him and that is the transformation that happens in people's lives when they encounter him Uh, and and don't we live in a time when perhaps more than ever we know that people desperately need to hear this 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 transforming news of Jesus in the cost of the living crisis and the energy crisis in in the kind of mental health crisis that we've been aware of has been happening for a long time now as people struggling with anxiety and depression all these things it's not as if they go away when you start following Jesus not at all but there is a hope that endures in the midst of them that allows people to lift their heads and our hope and our prayer is that people would discover it and one of the things that we did last year, we're doing again this year, is uh, a, a mission called Revive at Easter. And, and we're going to speak a bit more about that later. And Derek and I are going to both speak a bit about that. We, but the reason we do that is because we want people to experience this, this transformative effect as you meet Jesus. We want our friends to know and our family to know and our city to know because we care about people. The word that uh, the scriptures use, isn't it, is, is lost. But actually, if people don't yet know him... There's a sense in which they are lost. They've not yet been connected to that life-giving source, that reason why we're made, the relationship we're supposed to be in. People without him are are lost, and we want to be a church that's there for the lost. But also, I think the other reason why prayer is so important, the other reason why we want to do Revive Again at Easter, is not just because we passionately care about the lost, but also because we kind of... 
some of you will get this more than others. Maybe it might depend on, you know, if you if you your first time at church, you might not understand this. If you've been following Jesus for a while, you, you'll understand what I mean. There's also this sense inside of your heart that's like, do you know what? God is so good and so holy and so worthy. I I want to see people fall at his feet and surrender and worship because of how good he is. And it might seem strange to you. It's a bit like when you go to a re- if you go to a restaurant, new restaurant, and you're like, this is the best restaurant that I have ever been to. The food, the service, the environment, this is spectacular. And then what do you do? You, you go on TripAdvisor, you write a review maybe, you tell your friends, you tell everyone, you're like, if you're going to go, next time you go out for a meal, you need to go there. And if someone else goes to a different restaurant, you're like, you're indignant. You're like, oh, what are you doing? You fool. Go to this. This is the best one. This is the one that you need to go to. And then when your friends finally go to the restaurant that you know is the best one, there's this sentence of satisfaction. You're like, oh, well, they, they went because the, the, rest, the restaurant is worthy of them going. You know, it's like that, but times a million, you know, that, that God is so good. And when you see people engage with him and fall at their, his feet and worship and surrender. There's a sense in your heart starts to sing because you know that he's worthy of all the praise and all the honor and all the adoration. And I, you know, I love being in church and watching people worship the Lord because he is just so good. He's so good. And, um, you know, that's, I guess, where our heart comes from. We want to see people fall at his feet. We want to see the lost get found. And so that's why we want to do this mission in the spring, revive. That's why we want to be a church that gets out of these four walls and meets people in the streets, meets people in, in homes, in our own homes, meets friends, meets people wherever we find them to introduce them to him. Um, but as we come and think about revive, and please put the dates in your diary. It's going to be the 3rd to the 9th of of April, Easter week. We want that to be a really significant week where, you know, lives have changed. Thankfully, well, that's what we saw happen last time. We saw a few people, um, naming no names, Adam, uh, uh, just encounter Jesus, you know, for the first time. And it was incredible. Um, and we want to see that again. And, and we don't yet really know the nuts and the bolts about it, what we're going to do and et cetera, et cetera. It's all a bit up in the air at the moment. But we do know, I guess we know the why. And perhaps more importantly, we need to see that it starts now, that it starts now. You know, I think sometimes one of the problems, and I speak to myself here um, as much as anyone, because this is normally my job. <laughs> one of the problems is as churches, we're like, do you know what? We need to go and reach the lost and we need to, you know, see the nations bow at the name of Jesus and say, what do we do? Well, we'll have an event. We'll have a program and we'll print off flyers and we'll invite, you know, and we'll do, a, we'll do some, some marketing and we'll put it on the website and then, and then the people will come and then you think, oh, well, what do we need to do to prepare? Well, we better, you know, we better order the flyers and, oh, and what else? Oh, and we better, we, oh, we should probably pray, shouldn't we? We should pray before because prayer is a great way of preparing before we go and, and do the stuff. It's a great form of preparation, isn't it, prayer? And, and actually, you know, that's totally wrong, isn't it? Prayer is not the preparation, Prayer is, is the work. Prayer is, is where it happens. And so, of course, yeah, put the dates in your diary, revive 13th of April, etc., etc. But what matters is not so much that week, but what matters is actually that we gather to pray. That we gather to pray. You see, look at the early church in Acts chapter 2. You know, here you see a church that is exploding as people are coming to know Jesus for the first time. And you think, well, what was their strategy? What were they doing? Were they running an alpha course or something? Or, you know, what was, what was the program? What were they, were, you know, putting on lots of events? Well, I think in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, you see this beautiful verse of the kinds of things that they devoted themselves to that brought about explosive growth as the lost found Jesus. And it simply says this, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And then you go on, you know, everyone was filled with, a, with awe and wonder at the signs and wonders um, that were performed um, at the end of the verse, uh, at the end of that section, says, you know, they were praising God and enjoying the favour of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those that were being saved. And what did they do? You know, where was the grand programme? All they did was they, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, right? They listened to the apostles. You could, you could almost read, you know, they read the Bible, um, they, they had fellowship together, they hung out together, they encouraged each other, they loved each other well, they cooked meals, they had a meal train probably, they had fellowship together, 
Um, they're breaking of bread. They remembered the cross. They remembered what Jesus had done. and ate food together. And then they prayed. And that's it. That's the strategy. That's what they devoted themselves to. And I want to suggest, you know, if we're going to be the church that makes an impact on our city, the thing that we must do is commit to pray together. Commit to pray together. Long and short, that's it. That's how stuff gets done. That's how countries are changed. That's how cities are changed. That's how people are changed. As the church gathers together to pray, the world shakes. A few examples through history, because it's not just um, that we see this happening in the book of Acts, but I think throughout church history, we see the same pattern occurring. So 1904, Uh, If you were in Wales in 1904, you would have found a group of four 18-year-old lads um, on the side of a mountain praying together. And they were praying because they were praying for God to break in their church. They felt their church was dead and dry. You might feel that about Hope Church. Um, They felt their church was dead and dry, so they committed to pray together. They prayed for God to to break in, and they uh, up on the side of this mountain praying every single night, and people were laughing up at them, mocking them, you know, cool, you know it's, it's going to come to nothing, it's, you know, stupid, you know, just 18-year-olds, what they're doing, um, but they committed to it. A month later, two or three others started to join them, and it, and it grew um, to 12 or 14 people, and uh, they pray, and they pray, and they pray until revival broke out in Wales. And in uh, 19, that was in 1903, um, in, I think it was 1905 to 1906, or it might have been the year before that, 87,000 people gave their lives to Jesus. Isn't that incredible? I mean, we, we kind of you treat those numbers as, well, you know, some of them didn't stay in church for the long haul, okay, but it's, sure, it's encouraging though, isn't it? <laughs> you know, isn't that amazing? You know, when you pray uh, and God moves. And John Wesley, um, who, who in many ways was, was the father of what was the greatest revival this country has ever seen, the, the Great Awakening, which not just changed and transformed the church, but also society. You look at many things, so hospitals and education, even the RSPCA, the movement to, um, to uh, emancipate slaves in this country, all of it kind of has its roots in the Great Awakening. And this happened well, in, 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 uh, um, uh, in the 1700s or 1738. Wesley returned um, from, from uh, being in the States and his, his, ty- his mood at that time was he felt dejected. He felt God wasn't going to do anything. He felt lost in his own soul. He then went to go and spend a bit of time in Germany with a group called the Moravians who were a prayer, um, a, a group who prayed together. They're sort of a, a, an, an early example of 24-7 prayer. And they sent missionaries out all over the world. And Wesley spent a bit of time with them. And then he came back to England in, in I think it was eight, um, around the, t- the turn of the new year. And, um, and there's this uh, quote that he has. I meant to pull it out and I've not got it. But he says in this prayer meeting that they had, as they were praying together, the spirit fell in a miraculous way. And they were stood in awe. They couldn't move till three or four o'clock in the morning as they were just there praising him in an honor and and many people say that was the transformational moment at which the great awakening started to happen in that prayer meeting but it's not just about the one prayer meeting it really is about the consistency and about just turning up showing up again and again after and again one of the phrases I love to repeat in my own head to remind me is the kingdom of God belongs to those that show up you know it's about just turning up consistently Um, You might not have heard of Peggy and Christine Smith. They were 84 and 82 years old. Um, One of them was blind. The other one was crippled with arthritis. And every single night at 10 o'clock, they would gather together, the two of them, and pray. And they prayed and prayed and prayed till sometimes 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. These two old ladies, 84 and 82, on the Isle of Lewis. And some of you will know the, the, the revival that broke out afterwards, the Hebridean revival, the last great revival that we saw in the UK where, where, where so many people came to know, to know the Lord. And, and you know, there's accounts of people coming to church meetings to hear about Jesus. And before they even got to the meetings, they were struck down by the power of the Holy Spirit as they encountered him. And where does it begin? Does it begin with a great advertising campaign? Does it begin with a great program, a great event? No, it begins with two old ladies committed to praying faithfully to seeing God move in their midst. 
Now, I say this, and obviously the danger is you think that, you know, this is some kind of magic formula, and as long as you do this, you know, find a mountain, we'll go up and pray, and then inevitably two months later, you know, God will break out in revival. It doesn't always work like that, you know? Sometimes you might pray consistently for God to break out. You might not even see that happen within your own lifetime, but yet the call is still the same for us to consistently and faithfully pray and pray and pray and pray. And that's our main strategy. That's the main way in which we do stuff. That's how we get stuff done around here, is we pray and we bring it to the Lord and we trust him for more. And so um, we're going to talk a little bit later on practically about about some ways in which we are to do that. But Revive 2023, right? We want to see lives change and so We want to see people come to know the Lord for the first time. We want to see the nations bow down and worship before the feet of Jesus. But what counts and what's important is not so much what we do on that week, although that is important. Please put it in your diary. But what counts and what's important is that we hear this call that as the church gathers to pray, the world shakes. The world shakes. Don't hear that as a rebuke this morning, as a slap on the wrist for for not doing that. I find this hard as well. But an invitation to return to that again and to go deeper in it. Derek, I'd love to invite you up now to share a bit more. Um, Derek, I guess, is someone who has, you know, seen and experienced some of this stuff. And we had a great conversation a few weeks ago. And I thought it would be great for Derek to chip in at this point and bring us some more. So I'll hand over to you. Two years ago, I was sent to Coventry. I don't need no big talking points. I actually went to Coventry. And they had a, a huge tent on the uh, Memorial Park in Coventry. Every night, another evangelist called Mike and I, we were preaching there. But during the daytime, we went out to do other things. And one of the things we did was door to door work. Now, before you switch off totally, I'm not going to ask you to do door to door, right? <laughs> ah, well, well, what a sorry. Mind you, if you want to, come and, you know, come and talk to me. But the, in the afternoon, I got this group of young people from Youth for Christ to Coventry, and uh, they'd never actually done door to door work before. And I said to them, look, it's difficult, it's, it's really hard. You, you're, you're not going to knock on the first door, find someone who invites you in, and half an hour later he's kneeling down and uh, giving their life to Christ. It doesn't work like that. You, often you have to knock on dozens of doors. Sometimes you'll go all afternoon before you'll find anyone that will even give you the time of day. So uh, one young woman and I from the team, we went out, we knocked on the first door, the lady invited us in, and half an hour later she was kneeling down <laughs> and giving her life to Christ. So now there are Two things you can take from that. Either I'm such an amazing evangelist that all I have to do is knock on a door and people get saved. And that's the only time I remember it happening like that in 50 years of knocking on doors. But if you actually drill down into that a bit, what was really going on? Well, I know because after this was, we'd been there probably a couple of hours by then, we were drinking tea, the phone rang. And the lady was speaking to someone, and uh, the first thing she said to her was, I've just accepted Jesus, I've just become a Christian. And uh, then she was crying, and uh, I suspected the person on the other end of the phone was crying. Then she said, oh, she wants to talk to you. And uh, I said hello to whoever this person was on the phone, and she said, I have been praying every day for 15 years for my sister to come to Christ. And if you want to know why and how, what was the means that that God was using to bring that woman to Christ at that time, it was somebody who knew her, loved her, cared enough about her, loved her enough and loved Jesus enough to talk to one about the other and pray until she came to Christ. If you were... I think we're going to have the verses from Romans up on the screen. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. This wonderful phrase, every evangelist loves this. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Wow. Now, that doesn't just mean anyone that we can get to shout, Jesus! No, it doesn't mean that. It means that any person who comes to a place where truly, honestly, and humbly... They repent of all the rotten stuff in their life and put all their 
trust and faith and a hope in Jesus, in that moment, they will be born again by the Spirit of God, changed for time and eternity. They will be saved. Wonderful. But as soon as Paul says that, he asks some questions. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? You see, if people don't believe in Jesus, they can't call out (coughs) for salvation. And how can they believe in the one of whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. Now, these questions are all about how do people come to know Jesus? How can people in Lancaster come to know Jesus? Jesus. What is the role of the evangelist? We've got Greg Downs coming and uh, he's going to preach. What's his role? But perhaps more importantly is what is our role? What is the role of us in the church? What's our part in this? You see, having spent most of my life as an evangelist, I can say evangelists are useful people. They're good to have around. But they are not the key people. They really, really aren't. Because you see, Greg standing here for several nights in Easter week by itself will not have the slightest impact on the vast majority of people around Lancaster or to narrow it down a bit on your family, your neighbours, the person in the next room in the hall of residence. No effect whatsoever just having Greg standing here. There has to be some link between that person and him. And the only person that can possibly be is you, isn't it? (laughs) You see, all of us will have a circle of people around us. Some of them will be the only people in this church who even know them. There has to be the link. And the link begins with prayer. Now, have we got any Liverpool supporters here? Just gather around and pray for... Oh, no, don't, no, don't do that. <laughs> for, I'm going I'm to make you really jealous now. For one week in 1984... You remember 1984? <laughs> for one week in 1984, my office was the Anfield Trophy Room. How about that? And uh, I was there because it was my office because in, in 1984, for a week, the churches of the Northwest took over Anfield. Some of you will have heard of the evangelist Billy Graham. Uh, he's the man who has preached face to face to more people than any other in history. And uh, we had him preaching in Anfield Football Stadium for five nights, I think it was, in 1984. And every night in the uh, Anfield Trophy Room, we had hundreds of volunteers who were going through the responses. On the first night, three and a half thousand people walked forward (laughs) to declare that they were responding to the invitation to trust Jesus. And uh, our job was to make sure that every single one of those got visited by a local church. Now, But the question again is, how did those people get there? I lived uh, in a place between sort of Leyland and Preston. That's about 30 miles from Liverpool. And uh, I was the chairman of a group of people who were organising the churches in Preston to link up with what was going on in Anfield. And so, of course, yeah, we ran fleets of buses every night from uh, Leyland, Chorley and Preston to take people. But having Billy Graham in Liverpool and having buses running, it, it it does not get people there to hear the gospel. So for two years before those meetings were going to take place, I had a team of people that visited every single church that would let us come in that area. And we asked the churches to do one thing. We asked every Christian to do one thing. And that one thing was pray. We asked each person to prayerfully select the names of three people close to them that they saw on a regular basis, on 
more than speaking terms with and to undertake to pray for them every day for two years prior to this this coming up or or some came in and started later there's there's no magic about the number the it's just about praying <laughs> and to encourage them to do it we use something we call prayer triplets we we ask them to find two other christian friends and the three of them to meet once a week wherever they wanted morning coffee evening over a pizza no and just once a week meet and the three together pray for nine people you see when we pray together we do it you know we've all had prayer bookmarks given to us that we've put into the back of our bible and six months later it falls out and we say oh yeah what was i meant to pray for <laughs> oh it's, it's it's happened now it's too late <laughs> you see if you make a date and meet up with people you actually will pray for them and i promise you you will actually enjoy praying for them <laughs> you know the, the people had a wonderful time there was probably a lot of coffee and cake went on but what's an extra inch around the waist anyway and but they prayed and they prayed after this was all over i did a bit of a survey first of all i looked in our church st john's church leyland is where chris and i were at the time we had a, a lot of new christians in our church who were real followers of jesus as a result of that mission and when i drilled down into it a bit more carefully i discovered that listen every single one of them was being prayed for in one of those groups every single one of them has the name on a prayer trip card i found the person who had first written down their name and started praying for them and of course they were the people who had got them on the bus and had taken them there you see there's a danger that we think that if you simply bring in an evangelist and wind him up and put him on the platform and let him tick away doing his stuff that somehow we'll get new christians but it doesn't work like that See, to be honest, if, if Greg suddenly wasn't able to come and somebody else came and preached that night instead, God would probably do a very similar thing. You see, the, it's not the individual evangelist that it's all in. But if we don't do our bit with our friends, there's nobody that can replace that. You see, praying for people and then following up the prayer really is the key bit. When we visited all those churches to set up these prayer triplets, uh, we, we told them a piece of research that the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association had done themselves. 80%, listen to that, 80% of the non-Christians who attend Billy Graham meetings have been personally prayed for, invited, and taken to the meeting by a Christian friend who had known them well, usually for an average of about three years. That's the reality. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase mass evangelism. There is no such thing as mass evangelism. Just as there's no such thing as mass birth. Now, I don't know how many babies were born in the UK last night. It'll be many. But there's no such thing as mass giving birth, is there? <laughs> no, everyone is individual. And all evangelism actually is individual. Whether it's one person talking to one person, well, two of us, like in that house in Coventry, or whether it's Billy Graham preaching to a packed Anfield stadium. Evangelism is personal, it's individual, and it all starts with a believer praying for someone. So you see, when Greg Downs comes here uh, in April, what happens is, in many, many ways, much more down to us than it's down to him. What we do over the next few months will actually make the difference whether he simply preaches his heart out, calling a group of Christians to become Christians, <laughs> which is a bit pointless when you think about it. <laughs> and uh, let me tell you, it's one of the most frustrating things for an evangelist is to be asked to preach the gospel and realize there's nobody there who isn't already saved. <laughs> you know, that could easily happen. It could, and they, or we might say, well, let, let's send him out onto the streets of Lancaster and preach there so at least some people hear something. But, you know, 
why do we want to send Greg out to people that we've got no interest in going to ourselves? And why would we want to walk past all the people we know by name to talk for a few minutes to people we don't know? Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. I joined in the door to door, the, uh, the outdoor preaching la last time, and it, and it was great, and there's some fruit from it. But it shouldn't be the main point of the mission. The main point of the mission <laughs> should be a church of people who are praying for and witnessing to our friends. You see, what will make the real difference is who we bring with us when it takes place. And what will make the difference to that is the prayer that we start today. And what will keep us going in that is if we get together with two or three other people to make sure that we do do that. You see, the prayer is one of the great mysteries of the Christian faith. I was converted 58 years ago. I don't understand prayer. I could, I could keep you for a month with stories about answers to prayer and how God work, has worked through prayer. But I can't tell you how or why prayer works. It just does. God has decided that when people pray... In some way, that sets the Holy Spirit free to work. And two things will happen when we pray for people. Firstly, the people we pray for are changed. Not every person, not every time, not always immediately. But change takes place. People start being open. Spiritually, things start happening inside them. Maybe the Holy Spirit starts speaking to them even as we pray. And they're brought to a place where they're actually open and ready to know, to hear the gospel. But also, when we pray, the people who are praying are changed. <laughs> and we find we really begin to care about these people. We begin to care about whether they're saved or not. And we start spending more time with them, not, not to preach to them. They're, I'm not saying... You know, pray for them one day and start preaching the next. No, just spend time with them. Take every opportunity to be with them, spend time with them, to do them a good turn if you can. Just anything that builds up your relationship. And with these two things, prayer and the building up of the relationship, that's where the context for personal witness comes in. Peter said, in your heart, separate apart Christ as Lord and always be prepared to answer the questions when people ask you the reason for the hope you have. I've found that, it, that well, if, you, if you pray for people and spend time with them, you can wait for the questions and then, and then that's when you talk about Jesus. So that's really what we really want to do and uh, Jamie's going to come back and tell you exactly how we're going to do it. Fantastic. Thanks, Derek. So as we kind of uh, finish this morning, we are going to give out some prayer bookmarks, not for you to put in the back of your Bible and to forget about forever, but to write three names down on. So um, the steward's going to bring these around as, as we worship it, even now we can start bringing them around and, and dish these out. And on the back, you can write down there three names of people that you would like to, to commit to pray with. And then we'd really love to encourage you to go and do that. Find um, uh, two other people to form a prayer triplet, get together every week if you can, and to begin to pray for them together. And now you might want to think about working this into your kind of, um, you know, routine as it is, you know, things you're doing in church. If you're part of a life group, you might want to find three people in your life group. And then whilst you're at life group, there might be a chance before at the end to pray together. There might be people in a ministry team that you're working alongside. And again, you can partner with two of, two of those. And again, form a little group together to, to pray. And you can do that before or after you meet. Or if you know, go to CR, you could find people at CR and again, before or after you know, take some time to, to pray for these people. And do, do you know what? A little secret. The, the, more, the longer you pray, it doesn't make it more effective. Um, you know, it's more about, I think, the consistency to come before the Lord and ask, rather than, you know, you're spending, you're spending an hour praying over every single one. You make it for nine hours every time you meet to pray, and you pray for an hour for each person. That doesn't make it more effective. You know, it's about standing on that sense of, you know, spiritual authority. I'm, I'm here, and in the name of Jesus, not in my own power, in my own strength, but in his power, and in his strength, I'm going to pray for these three people to come to know him for themselves. You know, um, 
Just remind us, don't we speaking, I think, you know, as Jesus says, doesn't he, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, you know, which is almost this idea that underneath every single atom and every single molecule and every single particle of the universe, the sense of the presence of God, his love and his spirit and his grace and his generosity is emanating out from every single part of the cosmos. And the world is far more spiritual than we think it is. We think it's mainly physical. I think actually it's probably mainly spiritual. And as we pray, we start to shift something in the heavens that we can never shift in the present and in the physical. Like there's an amazing power that comes. You know, as the church prays, the world shakes. I'd like to invite the band up. And we're going to stand and pray and worship together. And as we're worshiping and, and together, you might want to just start to ask the Lord, you know, what was, you know, who are the three people that I need to pray for? Lord, would you show them to me? Would I be able to just hear your voice and your prompting? You might even today want to just write those names down. You might want to go away and do that and write those, 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 those names down and, and start to believe with faith that God can use you through prayer to move. You know, remember what I was saying about the restaurant? How much would you love to see God exalted high above all? How much would you love to see the lost come to know him? And we don't know whether a revival will break out or not. All we know is that we should pray for it, we should seek it, we should ask the Lord for it, and the rest is up to him, isn't it? It's up to him. Should we stand? Yeah, Father, we do ask you this morning, we pray now that, Lord, you would even, by your Spirit, start to reveal to us those names for which you want to call, Lord, those that you want us to go to, those that you want to see saved, Father. Would you just instill in our minds, even now, who they are? And we pray, Lord, that as we pray for them, that we would see them changed, we'd see them transformed. We pray for us for wisdom as we think about two other people to join with, to form a little prayer triplet, to pray for them, that Lord, we'd be able to do that with consistency and diligence and we'd commit to it. And we pray, Father, that within that, that group, Lord, we would we'd start to see answers to prayer. We do pray for this mission. We pray for Greg Downs, who's speaking. We pray for that week in April, that Lord, these prayers that we pray, we would see answered. That, Father, for your sake, for your glory, we would see people encounter you. We pray, Father, that for the sake of, of the lost, those that are hurting and broken in life, that they would see and encounter you for the first time. They'd be changed. They'd be transformed. And, Father, we pray more broadly for our church and for our city and, indeed, for our nation, that, Lord, we would see revival break out in a time such as this. Lord, we don't know when it will happen. We know that's in your hands. But Lord, here we are. We want to pray for it and seek it and see you do a great work, Lord. So move by your Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name.